Um, I'm Greg Kimball. I'm the Director of Public Services and Outreach here at the Library of Virginia, and we welcome all of you here. And with us today is Michael Pope, who is an author, journalist, and podcaster who lives in Old Town, Alexandria. You may have heard him on NPR or listened to his podcast, Pod Virginia. He is originally from Durham, North Carolina. We'll excuse that. Uh, <laughs> and he started his career in journalism at a newspaper in Tallahassee, Florida, so he's been around. Written for the New York Times, a Northern Virginia Magazine, and an Alexandria Gazette packet. He's the author of five books, and today, of course, he's here to talk about his most recent, which is The Bird Machine in Virginia, The Rise and Fall of a Conservative Political uh, Machine. So please welcome Michael Pope. Thank you so much for coming out today to hear me talk about the bird machine. Um, I want to start by talking about all of the many hours I spent in this building <laughs> at the uh, archives, reading mainly in the archives reading room, but also the local history collection. And there was even a part uh, toward the end of my research when I needed a bunch of photographs. And so I got to be like a VIP. When you go to special collections, they treat you like a VIP and they like escort you up there. And it's like, it's kind of high security. I never felt like a VIP at a library before, but uh, so thank you to the Library of Virginia for helping me uh, do all the research. Um, so I want to start by telling you a little bit about why I wrote this book and what's in it. So I have to start 20 years ago when I first moved to Virginia and I started asking questions to folks about like, how does stuff work in this state? And it didn't take me long to hear about the nefarious influence of the bird machine over and over again. People talked about the bird machine did this and the bird machine did that. And after like the 17th or 18th time, I said to myself, I need to know something about this bird machine. Um, so it seemed like it was something that was always kind of lurking around in the background as an explanation for why things work the way that they do in Virginia. So Virginia has only three statewide elected officials. That's a legacy of the bird machine. Virginia has a very long history of shortchanging public education. That's the bird machine. Virginia is a place where unions just don't have the same kind of power they have in other states. Again, this is the bird machine. And then, of course, there's systemic racism and white supremacy, right? The most notorious legacy of the bird machine is massive resistance, closing public schools rather than putting black children and white children in the same classroom. All of these things are the legacy of the bird machine, and it's an ongoing legacy. So the, the bird machine may have fallen apart in the late 1960s, but in many ways, this is a system that is still with us, like a zombie machine aimlessly wandering around. So I want to start my uh, talk today by taking a look at political machines. This is an 1871 cartoon, famous cartoon called The Brains by Thomas Nast. It's about Boss Tweed and the Tammany Hall political machine in New York City. So this is probably the most famous political machine in American history. If you've ever heard of a political machine, it was probably this one. Um, there are others, James Pendergast in Kansas City, James Michael Curley in Boston, but you'll notice all of those I just named, those are all big city political machines. So things work differently down in the South where the good old boy networks of small town Dixie used a combination of patronage and electioneering to maintain power. This is where the bird machine defied the odds, staying in power way longer than any of those political machines I just mentioned, outlasting Boss Crump in Tennessee, even Huey Kingfish Long in Louisiana. From his perch as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee in Washington, Senator Harry Byrd controlled Virginia politics with a kind of animal instinct that prevented anyone else from getting anywhere near the reins of power. As Time Magazine noted in 1958, the Byrd machine is an oligarchy composed of the few chosen by the few to make decisions for the many. So the origins of the bird machine are often traced to the day this guy became chairman of the state Democratic Party in 1922, a position he used to carefully oversee the flow of money and power. The bird machine was a statewide operation, but it operated as kind of a network of courthouse rings, sheriffs, judges, clerks of court. They all conspired to hold power by using the mechanics of elections to control outcomes. The New York Times explained it this way in 1949, quote, it has become as much a fixture in the comfortable cloistered life for the people of this state as say their faith in the Confederacy or their addiction to buttermilk biscuits and Smithfield ham. 
This is the New York Times. To relate Senator Byrd to, to relate Senator Byrd to this palpable monolith is a little like debating the divine origin of the scriptures. You know the answer, but just try to prove it. So thank you, New York Times, for the reference to Confederacy and the uh, buttermilk biscuits and Smithfield ham. This is what the New York Times thought of Virginia in 19, at the time, 1949. So the center of power for the Byrd machine was here at the courthouse. This is where the organization functionaries kept the engine running along. And election after election, county seats across Southside Virginia, up and down the Shenandoah Valley to the Eastern Shore, they all competed with each other to see who could provide the most lopsided victory to the machine candidates. The old Confederate statue guarding the courthouse ring was a not-so-subtle hint that retrograde forces were at work. Few people held as much power or had as much influence as the local clerk of court. Who, welcomed, who was welcomed in the back room of the Senator's Washington office and in the hotel suites here in Richmond. Historian Harvey Wilkinson put it this way, quote, there will always be a certain mystique surrounding the manner in which the organization picked its candidates for governor from the informal give and take to the courthouse preferences, the Senator's own wishes and the choices of the Senator's closest advisors, a preferred candidate usually emerged and proceeded to an almost certain victory in the forthcoming Democratic primary and general election. So the courthouse clerks organized the local elections for the organization candidates, aided by the sheriff and the Commonwealth's attorney. Members of the local board of supervisors worked as the public face of the campaign team, as did the delegation to the General Assembly. Behind the scenes, the chief judge of the circuit court uh, would encourage the support of the organization candidates to off offering to use his power to appoint key positions in the jurisdictions. So that your local circuit court, the chief judge of your local circuit court was the head of the political machine, mainly because of patronage. The bread and butter of any political machine is patronage. And in the bird machine, it flowed through the courthouse from the chief judge of the circuit court. During election season, as judges named members of everything from the electoral board to the school board to the welfare board to the board of reassessors, all of those appointments were all made by the chief judge of the circuit court. So he held all the patronage in the machine at your local courthouse. Wilkinson explained it this way, quote, this is one of my favorite passages from this book, quote, candidate appearances also featured a handshaking tour near the courthouse, followed by impassioned eloquence before a small but sympathetic courtroom crowd. Large fans hanging from the high ceilings to break the heat of a July afternoon, light green courtroom walls broken only by the faded picture of the county fathers and former circuit court judges. Harry Byrd grimly warming a warning of a grasping federal government. Such was a classic snapshot, which would soon take its place beside the New England town meeting and the presidential, the presidential whistle stop in the gallery of fond political memories. Harvey Wilkinson. So how did all of this happen? In order to answer that question, we need to go all the way back to the end of the Civil War and meet this guy. Former Confederate General William Mahone, after the Civil War, he transformed himself into a railroad executive and ultimately a United States senator who created Vir Virginia's first political machine in the 1880s. His meteoric rise to power was matched only by his breakneck fall from grace. Mahone was so exacting with his wardrobe that his tailor said he would rather make dresses for eight women than one suit for the senator. I think you can kind of see that in this photograph. He spoke with a squeaky voice and stood about five foot six, weighing, weighing in at about 100 pounds soaking wet, but don't let that fool you. He ran a cutthroat operation that seized power after Reconstruction and kept its steely grip on Virginia politics as long as possible. Historian C. Van Woodward put it this way, quote, in the whole gallery of Southern fixtures of his generation, he stands out as one of the boldest and most enigmatical. Mahone was a self-made man, not to the manner born, yet possessed of an imperviousness of will and manner and an overweening confidence in his own destiny. So not only did he make an impact in politics, William Mahone also left a lasting impression on Virginia's place names. His wife was a big fan of <clears throat> the novel Ivanhoe. And so several place names along the Norfolk to Petersburg line bear the names that reflected her taste in literature. 
This is the Waverly train station. This is one of the photographs I got at my VIP tour upstairs at the Special Collections. One of the many places in Virginia that still bear the memory of Mrs. Mahone's love of place names inspired by Ivanhoe. So that's Waverly. Other place names we can thank Mrs. Mahone for include Wakefield, Windsor, and Ivor. So at the end of the line, there was an infamous argument between this couple, the Mahones, and it led to a curious name. Apparently, they got into an argument, and so now Virginia actually has a place name called Disputania. This is a true story this, because of this dispute that the Mahones had. So William Mahone is a man of contradictions. He's a hero of the lost cause who helped Black people get elected to the General Assembly, railroad tycoon who became a hero to the working man, enemy of the establishment who became a political boss. His machine ended the poll tax, abolished the whipping post, boosted funding for asylums, forced the railroads to bear a larger share of the tax burden, and repudiated about a third of Virginia's debt. It increased appropriation for public education by 50%, 50% for public education, and opened scores of new schools across Virginia. It was also a ruthless and autocratic organization. He demanded office holders contribute a fixed percentage of their salary to the readjuster war chest. This is the party, the party war chest. 5% for state employees, 2% for federal employees. So you got a break, a little bit of a break if you were a federal employee. So uh, businessmen who scored state contracts were expected to share the wealth and help finance party activities, the readjuster party activities. Readjusters who held office were required to sign pledges agreeing to support bills and specific candidates approved by the caucus. His political machine fell apart after the Danville riot which prompted a wave of white supremacy and ultimately a new Jim Crow constitution that limited who could vote and consolidated power in a few wealthy white elites who hated Mahone and his machine. So what happened next is actually a reaction to Mahone. The new, these new rules of vote around voting swept this man into power. Uh, Thomas Staples Martin. This is the uh, portrait of Martin that used to hang in the Capitol. It's actually no longer there. Um, a lawyer from Scottsville who was counsel for the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. So a lawyer for a, a railroad. Railroad money is what we're talking about here. He led the second political machine. So Mahone was the first machine. This is the second political machine. This was largely a reaction to the Mahone machine. So uh, this was an era of concerns about election integrity. Between 1874 and 1900, no fewer than 20 congressional elections had been officially contested. That led to talk of a new constitutional convention to write new rules, and progressives were clamoring for what they considered election reform. Progressives wanted election reform, tightening the rules to prevent against what they perceived to be voter fraud. The era of Black elected officials in Virginia was about to come to a close. Enter this guy, Carter Glass. So like many people of this era, Carter Glass was a newspaper man. He left school early to become a reporter for the Lynchburg News, and within a few years, he owned the newspaper. When delegates to the Constitutional Convention met in 1901 to craft a new system of voting, Carter Glass was there with a plan to purify politics, and by purify, he meant white supremacy. So it's disturbing today how uh, freely people from this era threw around racial slurs, um, although it's important to know the language that was acceptable at the time. So the official record from the convention's fascinating document uh, includes this quote from Glass, quote, this is about the 1901 Constitution. Quote, this plan of popular suffrage will eliminate the darkie as a political factor in the state in less than five years. And that's kind of what happened. The new Constitution in 1901 dramatically reduced the number of voters. So if you take a look at the number of voters in the 1905 election and compare it with the previous election for governor, you'll see that there are like tens of thousands fewer voters. In 1901, progressive governor Andrew Jackson Montague was elected governor with like 200,000 votes. And so the, the next election cycle that had these new rules, 70,000 fewer voters were able to participate, which is like a, a huge percentage of the voters removed from the rolls 
Um, this time it was on purpose. Sometimes voters get removed from the rolls as a mistake. So this was uh, not a mistake. This was done on purpose. Um, so there's an irony here because progressives were the ones who were pushing for election reform. They saw this as like a good government movement ending, uh, but that ended up handing the keys to the kingdom to the machine, right? So the progressives wanted this constitution thinking it would be, you know, an anti-machine constitution. It backfired because uh, it actually helped the machine whose leaders, whose leaders ironically were uh, uh, reluctant to, to accept this change. So the machine people actually did not like this constitution because they liked the old rules that benefited them. Um, and they weren't really, they were suspicious of these new rules. So, uh, which is an irony because it obviously it helped the machine. Historian With Holt explained it this way, the reform of the electorate boomeranged on the reformers. It reduced the electorate by one half, removing that voting power at the bottom, which probably would have supported reform. So a um, bit more about this man at the center of the second political machine, Thomas Staples Martin. So during World War I, he oversaw the uh, greatest expenditure of revenue that was ever made by the United States government. But uh, that strain took a toll on Martin's health, and he may, which actually might have been one of the casualties of war. Um, when Republicans seized control, he became minority leader, but eight months later, he died in Charlottesville. And the future of the machine was in doubt. Um, his death in 1919 left a vacuum, and it was a vacuum that a young Harry Bird stepped into. Harry Bird was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, but it was a tarnished antique. His family could trace its history all the way back to the Blue Bloods of the 17th century, a time when William Bird arrived on the, on the banks of the James River and fought in Bacon's Rebellion. His maternal grandmother was a daughter of a U.S. senator and an ambassador to England. By the time Harry Bird was born in the summer of 1887, Virginia was in a state of genteel poverty. Historian Alden Hatch put it this way, quote, paint was peeling off the noble Corinthian columns of the great mansions. Roofs were leaky or obviously patched, and every man over 30 could remember the federal troops, the carpetbaggers, and going hungry because devastated fields, stolen cattle, and the wreckage of the economy. This was the world Harry Bird was born into. After his father was elected Speaker of the House of Delegates, a young Harry Bird decided to take charge of the family newspaper, which was struggling to make ends meet. So when a young Harry Bird took control of the Winchester Evening Star, it was in very sorry shape. Advertisers were notoriously late for their spots in the paper, and some, many of them just skipped out altogether. By the time the debt to the Antietam Paper Company had grown to like $2,500, this is a lot of money for the, the time period, the company refused to ship any more paper on credit. So Harry Bird had a crazy idea to save the newspaper, pay as you go. This was his plan. He would drive all the way to the Antietam Paper Company in Maryland every single day to buy one roll of paper, which is all he could afford. And then the next order of business was coming back to Winchester and tracking down all those deadbeat advertisers. Um, but the, so this is the newspaper business. He saved as a, saved the family newspaper as a very young man. But the newspaper business was not really the source of his financial success. The real apple of his eye was the Apple business. Um, this is another photo I got at the, um, up, up in the, uh, the, the VIP area, the special collections. Um, as a 19-year-old, Harry Bird started working the apple orchards in Winchester. During apple season, he lived in a truck that was like a house on wheels, a vehicle that also carried the spray rig and the tools. By 1911, he saved up enough capital to buy a plot on Hawthorne Drive in Winchester for an orchard of his own. Bird grew 16 different varieties of apples, which I find really fascinating. Some of these you may have heard of, but um, probably a lot of these are probably long gone. Here are some of the varieties of apple that he grew. Ben Davies, Albemarle Pippins, Grimes Goldens, Stamens, Yorkshires, Wine Snaps, Wealthies, and Smokehouses. I'm sure they were all tasty. So we've talked about the newspaper business and we talked about the apple business. The other important thing to know about a young Harry Bird is that he became president of something called the Valley Turnpike Company. So by the 1920s, the rise of the automobiles was putting new pressure on an old problem, the deplorable state of Virginia's highways. Before the Civil War, Virginia borrowed very heavily to build roads and turnpikes. After the war, the debt was paid at face value and road building became 
a local problem, but the rise of the automobile created new political momentum. So as a young state senator, Harry Byrd led a campaign to force a pay-as-you-go system on financing road construction. So he was taking what he learned from Saving the Family newspaper, using it in the state Senate on this road construction issue. In the early 1920s, many senators were hopeful they could persuade voters to approve a plan of debt financing for Virginia's highways. Byrd was totally against debt financing, and he led the forces. Um, he created like a statewide movement here to vote against the, the um, borrowing all this money for road construction and made a name for himself in the process, kind of became a, a person who was on the map because of his advocacy against debt financing. Historian Stanley Willis put this way, quote, here is an example of the methods of the new organization. Increasingly, there would be less room in it for those who, cho who chose to follow paths even slightly inimical to the dominant faction. Advocates of the reform were hopeful that foul weather uh, might help their cause, but uh, the anti-bond forces flooded the ballot box. Although a few cities actually approved the idea of borrowing money to improve roads, voters up and down the Shenandoah Valley rejected that idea. So too did the rural farming communities in Southside and Central Virginia. Harry Byrd had successfully marshaled his forces into a statewide operation, and he earned a reputation for himself as a political leader who had an iron fist concealed under a velvet glove. As Stanley Willis notes, with this victory, the Byrd era began. Harry Byrd was elected governor in 1925 at the age of 38 pretty young to be governor. He famously refused to wear a silk hat to his inauguration because he didn't want to be accused of being Silk Hat Harry. So Silk Hat Harry was a comic strip of the time period. And he did not want to be called Silk Hat Harry. Um, his most significant accomplishment during his term as governor was the so-called short ballot, eliminating the election for almost all of the cabinet members and making these all appointments. So, you know, this reform here paired with the voter suppression from the Jim Crow Constitution we just talked about, um, all these things together, Byrd, Harry Byrd now had a recipe for a durable political machine that would last well into the 20th century, perhaps even some ways still with us today. So after his term as governor, Byrd is appointed to fill the vacancy of the United States Senate where Franklin Roosevelt appointed Claude Swanson as Secretary of the Navy. So from Harry Byrd's perch in the Russell Senate office building, he oversaw the operation of his political machine that he put in place while he was governor. So during his time in power, the Bird Machine faced a labor crisis, opposition from young war vets, and ultimately self-destructed over the civil rights movement. So starting with the labor crisis, this is the Virginia Electric and Power Company known as VEPCO. So employees here decided they wanted better working conditions and better pay. So they started organizing a strike, but then they came across this guy, Bird Machine Governor Bill Tuck, um, the 235-pound Bill Tuck described Democratic national leaderships as political rapscallions, and he castigated opponents as Washington wastrels and union churls. He railed against Judas-like betrayals and outbursts of perfidy. He once described that an organization opponent had retracted like a man in a patch of sneezeweed. Friends liked to joke that he was most likely to secede. Tuck's solution to the potential strike at VEPCO was to conscript all of the employees of VEPCO into the state militia and then threaten to court-martial them if they failed to show up for work. It was a bold move, but it worked. The strike did not materialize, and Tuck followed it up the next year by passing the so-called right-to-work law, which forever undermined the power of unions in Virginia. Um, this was a time when there was really no Republican opposition to speak of. The real significant opposition came from inside the Democratic Party. After World War II, the opposition came from a group of youthful World War II veterans known as the Young Turks, and it was led by a guy by the name of Armistead Booth. He's featured there at the top. All of the Young Turks, you'll see their official portraits as they appear in the Capitol. So this group you see at the bottom here was trying to get more money for public education and ditch the racist poll tax. They tried and failed several times before they were finally able to increase funding for schools. The Supreme Court eventually stepped in and got rid of the poll tax. So the legacy of the Young Turks here ends up being a very important thing, which brings us to massive resistance. 
this is Moton High School in Farmville, where the beginning of the end started for the bird machine. So in the 1950s, this place was a fire hazard with bad heating and a leaky roof. Water fountains were few or far between, and the auditorium was so small, any kind of assembly was overcrowded and stifling. The Prince Edward school system promised to build a new school building in 1946, but five years dragged on without any action or funding. Finally, the students had enough, and they organized a walkout. Just before noon on a Monday morning in April 1951, more than 450 students walked out of the schools. They picketed and carried signs that read, we want a new school or none at all, and we're tired of tar paper shacks. Members of the student council began canvassing the white citizens of Farmville about segregation, asking them if they really wanted to continue having separate and unequal school facilities. Um, one student told the Associated Press, we don't care if it takes two years. We plan to stay out until we get some concrete information about a new school. Well, it took a lot longer than two years because the lawsuit dragged on and on and on. The students were threatened with disciplinary action um, if they continued to play hooky. So the students filed a lawsuit in federal court against the Prince William school system. And the complaint said the students were suffering irreparable injury and threatened with irreparable injury in the future. So one of the key prominent students here was Barbara Johns. This is the statue of Barbara Johns in Capitol Square, which I find fascinating because Capitol Square used to have Harry Bird in it, right? So now Harry Bird is no longer in Capitol Square, but Barbara Johns is. Um, so that's some measure of progress. Don't forget there are three Confederates still in Capitol Square. All right, so I want to, I end the book. This is a little bit controversial. So and some of you actually may disagree with this. I kind of ended the bird machine with the election of this guy, Linwood Holton, um, because once the Republican becomes governor, then the machine is over, right? The whole premise of the machine is you carefully craft who becomes governor. And so once you lose control of that, you have lost your political machine. So um, it's important to remember Linwood Holton ran twice for governor, once unsuccessfully. Um, one of the final chapters of the book, I talk about the 1965 campaign for governor. People forget that he ran twice. Um, so this was when Linwood Holton ran unsuccessfully as the Republican candidate against Mills Godwin. So Mills Godwin, this is the last bird machine governor. Mills Godwin gets elected as a Democrat. He later, of course, becomes elected also as a Republican. Um, but in 1965, Mills Godwin was a Democrat. Linwood Holton was his Republican opponent. And it was a really crazy election, which is why I put a whole chapter about this in my book, because they were not the only two candidates. There was also uh, this guy from the conservative party, William Story, who was essentially campaigning on massive resistance. He thought massive resistance was a great, great idea. And so the conservative party was, you know, pro massive resistance. Mills Godwin actually was dis trying to distance himself from the, you know, from his record on massive resistance. Um, and it, things got even crazier. So you got Linwood Holton is the Republican, Mills Godwin is the Democrat, William Story is the conservative. There was another candidate on the ballot from the Nazi party. His name is George Lincoln Rockwell, fascinating guy. So um, the politics in 1965, really very interesting. Holton loses 1965, but then makes a second go for it in 1969 when he was elected uh, against the Democrat in that race was William Battle, who was the son of a former governor from the 1950s. So he lost, but Linwood Holton won. And so once the Republican is in office, there's the bird machine. So uh, what is the legacy of Harry Bird? Well, his portrait is now gone. That This portrait of Harry Bird actually used to be right outside of the entrance to the state Senate, and it has been removed, as is his statue. Um, so, you know, the legacy of the Bird Machine is kind of still with us in many ways. I would say the existence of the, what we still call the short ballot. In other words, Virginia is very rare have only three statewide elected officials. This is a lasting legacy of the bird machine. Um, and then of course, the history of massive resistance, probably the best known part of the bird machine. Put this up here with uh, my other titles. Uh, if you're interested in George Lincoln Rockwell, the Nazi who ran for governor in 1965, I have a chapter about him in wicked Northern Virginia. Um, but I, so I'm gonna swap over this part of the proceeding and start taking questions from the audience. Is there a microphone back here? Excellent. Okay, so um, I think she's going to fill Donahue this with the microphone. You mentioned the 
quiet uh, in Danville. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether that's the incident that maybe I've heard referred to as the Danville massacre. Um, and I wonder what, if, if you have any comments on the role of that and Southside in this bird machine uh, history. And, and perhaps if I buy your book and read it, I'll know all this, but <laughs> perhaps you could- I would hope it. so, I would hope so. But um, yeah, the D Danville riot, Danville massacre, those it's uh, in reference to this incident that happened in Danville, which was essentially a race riot. Um, there were elect black elected leaders in Danville and this was part of a movement uh, that happened across many cities in this time period that kind of led to Jim Crow. All this sort of Jim Crow was a reaction to a lot of th these kinds of incidents, like the one that happened in Danville, which I think was actually recently fe featured in Cardinal News. Um, I think the guy recently wrote about this. Um, the one that I wrote about in my book is the one from the 1890s. And um, it's led directly to the Jim Crow Constitution. So the 1901-1902 state constitution that dramatically limited who could vote, I call it the Jim Crow, Constitu Jim Crow Constitution, um, that the, the Danville riots, Danville massacre, whatever you want to call it, led to this movement of, you know, people said, we got to do something about this race riot. And that's, that was their reaction, was creating the Jim Crow Constitution, which limited who could vote and kind of prevented black people from getting elected to office. I mean, the fascinating thing about the readjusters and one of the reasons why I've spent so much time in my speech talking about them is this fascinating and kind of forgotten period of history where black people were elected to the General Assembly and local elections in Danville and the Jim Crow Constitution wiped all that out. Um, and so that's, that's a very important fulcrum. And so the, this Danville event actually led to this constitution, which had this huge change, which is why these are all very important events in understanding the creation of the bird machine, right? It just, it didn't, it wasn't created in a vacuum. It was created as an, an outgrowth of the Martin machine, which was a reaction to the Mahone machine, which is why I wanted to make sure I had all these events um, together. But I um, hope I answered your question about the Danville event. Any other questions? Um, I was curious if, uh, so there were some outsiders, <clears throat> Democrats, who were elected during the Bird Machine. I'm thinking of James H. Price, for instance, in the late 30s. Why didn't uh, those folks have any effect on the continued power of the machine? Price was the one and the one that got away, I would say, the uh, the entire era of the Bird Machine they controlled all the governors except for this one, and which was really, I mean, if you think about the 1930s, that was really early in what we now know was the ongoing bird machine. Um, so the the all the politics in this time period were like, you just take Republicans off the map. Like Republicans were totally inconsequential until you get to the 1960s. So the, all the real politics was what faction of the Democratic Party are you in? Are you in the machine faction or are you in the anti-machine faction? And um, and there were anti-machine people, and there were regions of the state where the machine had less power, um, but they were marginal because they always lost, um, with the one exception of James Price, who was the kind of non non-machine governor. Um, so yeah, that he is the the exception on that. And there were anti-machine candidates, anti-machine elected officials, you know, leaders in the General Assembly who tried to work against the machine. They were largely unsuccessful for like 50 years. Um, hope that answered your question. Level today, are are there still machines? And hopefully not, but if there are, how do we prevent machines from, you know? One of the unexpected things that happened to me after writing this book and giving these kind of speeches is people will come up to me and say, you know, if we wanted to create a machine today, how would we do it? <laughs> um, I would say people throw around machine a lot in ways that aren't necessarily, you know, a formal political machine in the way that we were talking about earlier in the speech. I mean, for example, like, you know, in the Hampton Roads area, there are people talk about the Stolly political machine. 
um, because there are a bunch of related people who, you know, all had elected office for quite some time. Um, that's not really a machine in a, in a formal sense, because like when you talk about machines, you know, you're using patronage and money to control the outcomes of elections. So like the whole thing about the bird machine is the patronage that flowed through the circuit court judge who ran your local courthouse ring and the machine sort of used the courthouse ring. So we don't have that kind of formal that's a statewide operation. I mean, like, even if you think about big cities, um, they people use the word political machine kind of differently. I mean, if you want to think about it in a formal way, they don't really exist anymore. Um, largely, I think a lot of political reforms were put in place to prevent the, you know, from using patronage and money to control the outcomes of elections. Um, but uh, yeah, people still use the word, but it actually kind of means something probably a little different now. So we have any more questions? Yes. Yes. Um, so my parents actually were a little bit older than most of the parents that were around me. Um, and my aunts and uncles, a lot of them actually were affected directly by massive resistance and all of the things around. Me. Um, how do you think, because and I grew up in Petersburg. Though we did not have all the things, as you said, it still was effects of it. I didn't know that other people didn't have sinks hanging off the wall at day school until I moved to Richmond. Um, how do you think at that time it affected urban areas differently than your outliers? Because they were out in Mecklenburg County way out. Um, so how do you think it massive resistance affected the urban community, communities differently from out there? Well, the students were actually impacted in a very negative way because i mean if you think about like those are the schools that closed and i mean this is so radical people i mean people use the word massive resistance but like think about this the decision was they decided to close the public schools rather than integrate them this was kind of a radical idea um supported by many people um but like if you talk about what you're talking about the urban areas those are the schools that closed right so they um were directly impacted and the so there are people still alive today who actually did not have a public education for a significant amount of time because their local state, their state government decided to close their local school rather than integrate them. Um, so the, it is interesting that that group of people actually has a form of reparations. So like there was a, a law that was passed several years ago that allowed the people who were denied a public education because of massive resistance to get like college scholarships and money to go to schools and you know as a way to account for the fact that they lacked the public education for the time the state wasn't offering it and um so that is a form of reparations actually it's also interesting just recently uh like this year the general assembly passed a, a bill that would allow the descendants of people who were denied a public education to participate in this same scholarship program and republican governor glenn youngkin signed a reparations bill um that uh, so that's uh, the victims of massive resistance uh, are still still around and um this is a very important part of our history that i hoped was documented in the book so we have another question here, yes. Um, okay. I'm familiar with the Prince Edward County uh, events of massive resistance. Uh, you're almost sounding like you're saying this was actually more widespread statewide, with schools closing and stuff? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There were schools all over Virginia that uh, closed. So it was um, Prince Edward was one of them that led to the lawsuit, right? So the, there was a significance of that particular situation because it was wrapped into the lawsuit that we now refer to as Brown versus Board. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Virginia has this odd political structure in that governors can't succeed themselves. They're elected for four years. It's the only state in the union. Does it, isn't that, uh, it doesn't run true that a machine would have a structure where a governor couldn't uh, succeed himself. That was. I mean, do you have any thoughts about that? That's yes. Um, so one of the I was at the beginning of my speech, I was talking about how people kept bringing up the bird machine all the time when I asked why things work this way. And so um, it's this thing about the governor not being able to succeed himself 
is not the creation of the bird machine, but it is the kind of thing that people often blame, you know, the bird machine for this, and they'll blame the bird machine for that. And the bird machine did not create this, they inherited this, right? Um, they decided not to change it in their time in power, um, so they could have changed it. So another example of this is like, we don't have party registration in Virginia. You don't, you know, in other states, they re re register as a Republican or you register as a Democrat. This is another kind of thing that people blame the bird machine for, but they did not create the system. They inherited this system. Important to point out, they could have changed it when they were in power, but they did not do that, right? So um, they actually did benefit from this because they, Republicans would often participate in, or Republicans and non-Democrats would often participate in Democratic primaries to help the machine candidates. So um, this is not the, so your question was about the governor succeeding himself. They did not create that, they inherited that. Um, but, and you would imagine that they might've had a vested interest in changing that. But one thing about the, all these machines I talked about is they kind of like the existing rules. They figured out a way to game the system and they don't want things to change because they've already got their system down. Yeah, and the, also a lot of people were often waiting their turn. I mean, the whole thing about the bird machine is, is a very specific kind of path to power. You know, you serve, you serve in the General Assembly, usually in the state Senate. Uh, you might have a, you know, be elected to attorney general, a lieutenant governor, and then you become the, the governor. And so there were a lot of people that were like, you know, had their path to power kind of worked out and they were waiting their turn. So yes, I we had some more hands, I think, up. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, would Harry Bird and the Bird Machine work in today's political system? Where where would you put them into right? Well, I mean, I use the word conservative in the subtitle of the book and um got some negative feedback about that. Um, but that's fine. That's fine. Um <laughs> they were conservatives. I mean, um they did, I mean, take, so massive resistance is a horrible atrocity. So like, let's set that aside for a second. They were against debt financing. They really could, they were sort of financially conservative as well. Um, they did not like the, I, anything where you borrowed money. They, they did not like borrowing money. Like the whole pay as you go system that Harry Berg worked out at the Winchester star, you know, he grafted that onto his political philosophy. They didn't really like investing in things like schools. <laughs> so um, the, they were parsimonious with their funding for education. Um, I, we, you, know, you might have some thoughts about how all of that works in today's political environment. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered your question. Um, delicately, I was trying to answer that delicately. Yes, I have another question up here. I read back in my undergraduate days a pamphlet, it was in political science class, on the rise of the Republican Party in the South as leading the whole desegregation effort, and it had to do with racial. But um, to what extent did Governor Holton, who seated the machine, rise on that power of what was happening in the Republican Party and civil rights, if you will, and equality? Well, he benefited, I would say, he definitely, Linwood Holton, the Republican who was elected governor in 1969, definitely benefited from massive resistance becoming toxic, right? So after the, the people that liked massive resistance, you know, were all gung-ho about it until it failed and they had to integrate their schools, right? So after the massive resistance ended, and the courts forced Virginia to integrate the schools and the governor, the bird machine governor actually took action to integrate the schools. A lot of the machine people, you know, felt like they had been, you know, um, that they were not happy with the outcome of forced integration. They were not happy with the bird machine for failing on massive resistance and then there's this fulcrum, massive resistance becomes politically toxic. So this benefits, you know, Linwood Holton because the Republicans are the beneficiaries of the toxicity of the politics around massive resistance. And that's how he gets elected governor. Yes. She's gonna bring a, a microphone. 
I think you said that uh, Virginia is the only state in the union that has only three statewide elected offices. Uh oh, are you going to give me a counterexample? I hate this. No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wish I could. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Virginia. No, but it's a two-part question. What are the consequences of that structure? And does your crystal ball have anything to say about the future of having only three statewide elected officials? Will that change ever? What does what does that really mean for Virginia? So, you know, people think about constitutions as being around forever, but, you know, like our current state constitution is from 1971, right? And so the people who wrote it are still alive. Like the guy in charge of that is a UVA professor. I, I've, I've talked to him. So like, um, it's not out of the question that Virginia might in our lifetime have another constitution that actually totally could happen. Um, if If that happened, would they change the structure to have more statewide elected officials? That's an open question because we're talking about a theoretical constitutional convention that isn't happening right now. But it, if it did happen and people were thinking about creating a new constitution, this would be one of the issues they wrestle with. Is it okay to have all of your cabinet appointed by the governor? You know, in the other states, they elect the person who oversees elections. We don't do that in Virginia. The governor appoints that person. In other states, they elect the person that oversees public education as an education secretary. We don't do that in Virginia. We give the governor all of that, all of that power. So, um, you know, before the short ballot in the 1920s, all of the cabinet officials in Virginia were elected. Um, and that was kind of a burden, right? So, like, if you're a voter... Do you want to take the time? So you're taking the time to learn about the candidates for governor and the candidates for lieutenant governor and the candidates for attorney general. Do you also want to take the time to learn about the agriculture secretary candidates? I mean, this is this was part of the appeal of the short ballot. Um, so I think the answer to your question is, if there was a constitutional convention in Virginia and they were going to write a new state constitution, this was an issue. This would be an issue that they would wrestle with and have to make some sort of de decision on. Do they want to keep the system that hands the governor all this power? Virginia actually is the governor of Virginia. I would argue is the strongest governor of any governor across the states, and it's because of the short ballot because he has all this power invested in him because voters don't choose his cabinet. Um, so I hope that was answered to your question. Yes. Is the fact that Virginia has off-year elections related to the bird machine, and if so, how was that used by the machine to their advantage? Uh, yeah, another thing they inherited. So uh, people love to blame the bird machine for you know the the, 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 the lack of party registration and the odd-year elections, and um, they actually inherited this. Um, it did benefit them because lo I mean odd year elections tend to have lower turnout and the bird machine loved a low turnout. I mean, this was their, their path to power was low turnout. So um, they, you know, like, like many things they inherited, they could have changed it when they're in their 50 years in power, they chose not, not to do that um, or even have the discussion about it. So one would imagine they liked that system of the odd year elections because it benefited them because low turnout was the name of the game and their, their machine, the way they structured it. Yes, ma'am. You're from North Carolina. Why the huge interest in Virginia? <laughs> yeah, um, I am from Durham, North Carolina. Um, I went to college in Tallahassee, but I, about 20 years ago, moved to Alexandria and became a newspaper reporter. Um, later started working in public radio. Um, but how I got interested in all of this is because as a as a political reporter trying to understand like the state Senate, um, so much of that history is tied around Byrd. I mean, like there was like this portrait of Harry Byrd used to be outside of the Senate chamber. Um, and so, I mean, like the the ghost of Harry Byrd is still quite literally haunting the building. Um, so I would say, I mean, the, the answer to the question, like, what's the guy from Durham like writing about uh, the Byrd machine is, well, it's been mainly my interest in Virginia politics as a journalist, um, because it is the explanation for basically how things work in Virginia is because of the bird machine, um, which, and, and again, you know, I've kept hearing about it over and over and over again. I said, I need to know something about this bird machine. And so like, in some ways I've been collecting bits and pieces for this book for, for many, many years. Yes. As a child, I grew up in an area 
I would say minutes away from Bird Park. And it was always uh, a place to play and jump and run, but I heard stories from um, a father and his friends, World War II veterans, about the mix, um, I guess the, the mix ingredients of how your mind might think they grew up during a time in the war with FDR being a Democrat, yet and still a Democrat here in the state of Virginia was against anything. So, you know, it was touch and go up and down. And then of course, used to fly in and out if we were ever privileged to do so at Bird Field. So we heard all these bird, 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 bird. But I wanted to ask you, since you're from North Carolina, are you aware? <laughs> We have family from Wilmington, and they they escaped the race riot of 1898, the Wilmington race riot. And if, if there's anything you can kind of associate with that and what you're speaking here, I know it's out of the state, but still, there was a connection in all of this. Yeah, and full disclosure, I grew up in Durham, but like I moved out of Durham when I was like 14 or 15. So I really, my all my memories of Durham are like as a child, but um but I believe if I understand the specific incident you refer to, it was around the same time as the Danville riot, right? Okay. So yeah, I mean, like the 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 Danville riot, Danville massacre, whatever you want to call it, was one of a series of events like the one that you're talking about in North Carolina and elsewhere that led to the Jim Crow movement. I mean, like this is all sort of you in order to understand Jim Crowism, you have to understand what led to it. It was a reaction to black people holding elected office and in, in, not in reconstruction. People sort of in their mind, they think about like um, civil war, reconstruction, civil rights movement, right? But that actually uh, overlooks a very important sort of ebb and flow after what happened after reconstruction, after all the Southern states were readmitted to the union. What happens next is a chapter that many people have forgotten where you have all these black elected officials and you had the readjusters and they were ending the poll tax and opening new public schools. And that these events you're talking about are the end of that period. Like the, I mean, if you're writing a chapter, <clears throat> it would start with the end of reconstruction, the, read, the readmission of all of the Southern states, all the Confederate states. And that chapter would end with these incidents that you're talking about. In fact, I think my chapter literally does end with the Danville issue. So, um, because what happens next is the era of Jim Crow. Um, so yeah, all of those incidents did happen right around the same time period and they were very significant in, in what led to Jim Crow and Jim Crowism. We have lots of questions. I love your questions. Yes. So my question is, I'm trying to make sure I formulate it properly. Um, so looking at the Farmville schools and the issue um, that they were having back then, and that was decades ago, and looking at today, the school system that is separate um, and unequal in all of the low-income address zones across the United States and the people who are actually affected by that. How do you view the fact that there are laws that the General Assembly made that actually keep it that way based on taxes, local taxes? Well, that's a thorny funded. question. How would I, how would I, so um, the schools are funded largely by property taxes, which means that in wealthy areas, they have wealthy schools. And in areas where the property values are not high, the schools are not as good because that's how the system is financed. The General Assembly could, if they wanted to, figure out some other way of financing the schools that wasn't based on property taxes, but they haven't done that. And I don't get the sense they're going to do that anytime soon. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I, that's probably an unsatisfying answer to your question, but, um, the, the system of funding the schools creates this disparity that you're talking about. So how do you address that disparity, change the way it's funded or figure out some way that accounts for that imbalance? But, um, and, and I think there have been efforts to figure out ways to account for that imbalance, but obviously it's an imperfect system because we still have these disparities. This will be our final question. This is, I'm not from 
this area originally. This is a pretty simple question. Where does the terminology Jim Crow come from? Why, why is that used? Jim Crow was a character in vaudeville. Um, and so it's actually the roots of, it was not a person, it was a character um, in vaudeville, you know, which was a kind of traveling performance that was like a variety show. So like a vaudeville performance would include like a juggler and a singer and someone reciting poetry and um, this character comedy, character driven comedies. And so, yeah, the, the, the origin of Jim Crow was that it was a character like today, the modern equivalent of this would be like an SNL character, like for Saturday Night Live that the character would be a famous, the character would sort of take on a fame. Um, and so, yeah, that's the origin of it. But um, it was, you know, vaudeville was very popular in this time when Jim Crow was created. We'll go ahead and finish up because we're at one o'clock, but please do feel free to stay and ask our author. Let's have one more big hand from Mr. Pope. 